hit on the idea of manufacturing solutions. So in November, you had a post on Twitter about the idea of scalability. You noted that beam, at Beam, uh, you strive to get these exciting technologies to more patients faster. You propose that one of the solutions is automation and that you have several big robots running many experiments constantly and in parallel. You also posted a cool video of uh, Beam Team Rovers in the automation lab. Could you share with us how you plan to leverage automation and robotics? And since then, have, has there been any update on the $83 million, 100,000 square foot uh, biomanufacturing facility in Durham, North Carolina? And how might that spearhead partnerships down the line? I know that's a lot of questions we can break it down. Yeah, yeah no, they're, they're good. Um, yeah, so again, scalability is something we've been thinking about from day one, particularly you know as Pino joined and we sort of talked about how are we going to build this thing. And the reason is because of the technology. We said, wow, we think that we have a big advantage here on the, on the core technology and we think there's a lot of ways we can use it. And so that means we need to scale. So, the, you know, we talked about delivery then as sort of the next big component of that, which is where, you know, how do we get as many organs as possible? The, the third leg of the stool is how do you, how do you make it? And so that, that's manufacturing. And, and again, genetic medicines, these are complicated things. You know, there, there are not mature manufacturing contract organizations you can go to who've done this a thousand times. There are some who do it, but, but they are in high demand and it's still not your organization. Your, your science is developing in real time. And so, we do believe that long-term we need to internally control manufacturing and the know-how and, and capabilities and the team, frankly, the workforce to do it. You know, it's, it's, it all, again, it all comes down to people who know how to do this well. And so we did make a decision that very early in our process, we would go and start to build out an internal capacity for manufacturing that's in North Carolina. So as you said, uh, 100,000 square feet, I believe that's the largest dedicated facility in the gene editing industry. We're building out in stages, but it's going to be quite significant. It can do clinical and ultimately also commercial. Um, so that's that, uh, slated to be online in 2023, and that's still that's still on track. Um, we do, of course, use external manufacturers because our current trials obviously aren't coming out of North Carolina yet. But over time, we'd like to see uh, more and more go there. So that is a big part of our strategy for sure. Um, and then uh, automation, you mentioned, which is which is interesting. Yeah, we, so that was another thing we very early said. You know it would be really nice to have as much of this automated as we can, because then, you know, our very brilliant and creative scientists can spend more time being brilliant and creative and less time pipetting, right? And, and that was a sort of initial idea, but it's actually pretty amazing how far it's gone. And so we basically now have an incredible automation team with these big robots. They're basically liquid handling, moving trays around from sort of different, um, you know, machines, assays, um, process steps, things like that. Um, and, uh, and they, we, we basically can do things like, let's say you edited a mouse, you can take a slice of the mouse liver, drop it on the robot. And then the scientists will get the end, the, the genetic sequence from the sequencing in their email inbox, like but, all of the processing and the isolation and the sequencing that happens is all automated. Right. So that's, I mean, that's incredible. So, so we're doing as much of that as we can. Uh, the rovers are cool. So they're basically, they're, they're our newest toy. They, uh, they can give you more flexibility in how you move trays around. And then ultimately, as we get multiple big robots, they can actually drive from one robot to another. And then you kind of linking systems together. Uh, so my my son is part of a, a Lego robotics team. And so we, we were taking a tour uh, to sort of see that in action. And uh, and it's it's really pretty exciting. So so automation is a big part of what we do. And again, all, all to try to do as much as, as much as possible get more programs moving forward and then ultimately, you know, treat more patients. So will those rovers be available by Christmas? <laughs> <laughs> I think we were, I think they're, we're working with uh, one of our vendor partners on this. I think we were the first company to actually implement those. So, you know, wow. I mean, I, I think the whole culture of innovation at Beam is just, it suffuses everything and we want to be as innovative in the automation and in the organization and, and the, the business as we are in the science. I mean, the whole thing should be should be creative. Um, so John, I just want to clarify, you mentioned commercializing your manufacturing. Does that mean that you you maybe foresee other companies coming to you for their manufacturing, like, you know, hmm. LNPs in particular? Is that what you is that what you meant by saying that? Yeah, it's a good question. Um, there's probably different ways we could we could talk about that. So one would be just our own medicines eventually, right? So if we ever get an approval. We will decide which medicines does it make sense for Beam to commercialize, and then we would be able to manufacture that for commercial supply out of that facility. So that's an important factor. Um, but actually, and you would ask the question about partnering, which I didn't answer. But yes, you know, a, a lot of the part about scaling and having this high throughput 
is it means we can do a lot. It will be more to, that we could do than we can prosecute ourselves in development. And that's going to be true. But, but what that does, it creates opportunity for partnering. And now we can put programs in other people's hands uh, that they might even be better at moving forward than we will and or that we together can do something even even more special and then and then again increase the total amount that can move forward and the, and, the, and the impact we can have and so and so yes at some point maybe that does include the manufacturing side where you know you can come to beam and you can get it all you can get the editing you can get the delivery and and even we can make it with high quality and i think that's that's important i think that there, there's still a lot of fragmentation in this field and you know, for me, if there's a compelling bit of biology or a patient you want to treat, it, it seems crazy that you have to do three different arm's length deals just to put together one program concept and then start to move it forward. You know, it's much better in my mind to have all of it under one roof and then we can put it all together and then you're off to the races, you know, moving to the clinic. Sometimes we joke on Twitter about like Beam is going to be base editors as a service, sort of like we think of software as a service, you know, maybe it will be LNPs as a service, you know, who knows? I think that's not crazy. I mean, I, I think we have we have been, I think we do a lot more in our platform in terms of creative business development and and trying to sort of do clever ways to 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 make more things happen than than certainly any other company that I've seen recently. And I think I think we only want to do more of that, especially as we continue to put all of this technology and capability into one place. We'd be crazy not to have that be a big part of, of what Beam does. For sure. I'd like to discuss two of your lead hematology programs, Beam 101, activation of fetal hemoglobin, and Beam 102, the Macassar variant direct cor uh, correction of sickle cell causing mutation. Could you describe the benefits of both strategies, you know, some of the differences between them? And do you plan to move forward with just one or hopefully both in the treatment of sickle cell disease and beta cell? So could you talk us just, uh, through your decision process there? Yep. Yeah, so we have two programs for sickle cell disease. Um, Beam 101 takes the now clinically validated approach of raising fetal hemoglobin, which is a, a kind of hemoglobin that turns off when you're six months old, but if it's on, it can compensate for the presence of the sickle protein, the sickle globin that's causing the disease in sickle cell. And, and so we have one that is without cutting and non-viral, it can go in and it literally changes single letters in the on-off switches of the fetal hemoglobin genes, turns them back on, uh, and we get very high levels of editing over 90% and very high levels of F. Uh, over 60%, and then concomitantly, the, the S level, the, the sickle protein is turning down. And so we're down mm -hmm. around 40% or less uh, sickle protein. And that's actually the same ratio that you get with a patient who has sickle trait, uh, it, where they have one copy of sickle and one normal copy of hemoglobin. So, so we think that's quite important, and it's actually a slightly better profile than what others are getting in the clinic. And so we think that's a potentially best-in-class way to do that fetal hemoglobin strategy. Beam 102, is the direct correction. So we go right to the adult hemoglobin gene that's mutated. Every patient has a single letter misspelling and we can edit it back to a normal copy. And so that's super exciting uh, as well. And so now you're literally creating cells that don't have the sickle protein at all. And so when you look at the total edited cells where editors, you know, we're editing over 80% efficiency, uh, you're, you're down to about 10% S uh, in total and everything else is normal hemoglobin. So that's, that's very exciting. So we love both of our children. I think they're I think they're both potentially best in class products. We'd be thrilled to have either one of them, and we have both. So our basic plan is to not try to overthink it and just follow the science. And so we're going to move both of them into the clinic. We'll get data with both, uh, and and then compare and contrast, and we'll figure out. You know, I, I think it is likely that at some point in development we will make a choice of which of these two will we register uh, for approval in in sickle. Um, in the case of 101, that can also treat beta thalassemia because you're upregulating that fetal hemoglobin. Um, so that's another possible path that program may take. And so that's all part of our clinical development program. And then, as I mentioned before, you know, in parallel to those paths, which which we're quite excited about, we will also be working on conditioning, which we want to we want to basically make that regimen for the transplant uh, less toxic. And we have a lot of ideas for that, which we think can make it better. And then ultimately start to think about in vivo delivery, as we talked about, where you're getting rid of the transplant altogether. And so this is a really long journey. But the nice thing is those same Beam 101 and 102 editing payloads would be the same ones that move into those waves two and three, where we're thinking about better transplant or in vivo delivery. So this is all really one integrated strategy uh, to try to create what we think is the best regimen to cure sickle cell patients you know, here and abroad. And John, I just want to add, because I think we skipped over just a little bit, um, 
the actual the the is it the Makassar? Am I pronouncing it correctly? Yep. Makassar variant is not actually the wild type variant or the wild type gene, you know, that most of the population has. With your deaminase, you're actually able to change it to the Makassar variant, which is also a functional copy. Could you explain a little bit about what you're doing? You know, is that yes. is it still expected yes. to be just fine in patients? Yes, yes. So so basically, so the so the edit we make with the A base editor is an A to G edit. So the in the and so it's 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 a there's a class of mutations called transition mutations, uh, which are A to G and G to A, and then C to T and C to T. And those are the edits we can make with the base editors back and forth, um, based on the chemistry that we're doing literally on the on the genome. So that represents about 30% of all point mutations, or 30% of all total mutations, uh, and well over half of all point mutations. So um, so there's a lot to do with those. The sickle mutation is not in that group, actually. The sickle mutation is an A to T or a T to A change. Okay. Yeah. Um, and so we can't do an A to T with the current A base editor. We would need some different chemistry uh, to do that. But it, it fortunately turns out that the A to G change we can do, it gives you a different allele, but one that is normally occurring in the human population. It is not the dominant one that most people in the audience will have, uh, which is which is would be a T. Uh, but with the G, you get this thing called HBG or Macassar, and 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 basically the the punchline, as you as you said, is it is a, a normal functioning hemoglobin. So there, there's you know there are it's about 0.1 percent of the human population probably has it, uh, and actually at Ash, this is the other uh, data update we gave. You know, just to be, I mean, for 40 years people have known about this form of hemoglobin and 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 and, and that it is normal, but you know we want to be made really really sure, and so we've been doing all sorts of different studies to sort of really show that it is indeed superimposable on the on the on the normal more prevalent copy of hemoglobin and indeed that that is the case so so we fully expect this to be um you know a, a curative you know conversion of the mutant protein to to the um to the normal and so john you also you also men mentioned that idea of uh conditioning so can you explain the importance of your non-exclusive partnership with magenta for their targeted condition approach to reduce toxicity challenges associated with the standard of care, you know, how is it differentiated from traditional chemotherapy or radi radiation regimen? And why do you feel this partnership was in your best interest? Yeah, so we, we, we like the Magenta program a lot. So the basic idea here is you need to make room in the cell, in the body for the new edited cells to come in. Uh, and so you can do that with chemo, which kind of wipes out all of the cells that are there and there'll be plenty of room. Uh, but in the process, it's doing a lot of genotoxic damage, and and you know, and it's just it's just harsh on the patient. So what we'd like to do is have a have a less toxic uh, regimen. So the idea here is to use much like precision oncology therapies, to use antibodies that can go right in and target in this case the hematopoietic stem cell itself, uh, and try to get rid of that, but not have such a deep impact on the other uh, cells around it, and to get rid of it in a, you know, not using just a, a, a chemical warhead, but something that's a little more, more um, uh, sort of smart. Um, and so Magenta has a really nice program um, targeting the Kate receptor uh, on HSCs uh, that looks really good. That's moving into the clinic now. They're gonna begin in AML, but their long-term vision is to bring that into the transplant. Um, so we think that looks really, really interesting. But one way or the other, we wanna make sure we get to this sort of vision that there will be a, a less toxic um, uh, conditioning agent for transplant, because what that means is it means that more patients will opt for the therapy, right? So in Gen 1, if you're using chemo, there will be some number of patients who have severe disease who are going to definitely want to get these treatments, and I can tell you the demand for clinical trials right now is very high, um, but there will be a, another set of patients who look at the transplant and say, ah, that doesn't make sense, and, and this, and this you know, just doesn't feel like the right time for me. And for them, I'm, I'm quite hopeful that we'll have good small molecules and antibodies and things like that, and those are coming, which is great. If we can make conditioning better, we will shift the balance where more and more people will start to opt for a curative genetic therapy. Uh, and then, of course, long-term, that in vivo uh, editing, I think, is the is, is will even more. You know, it's just that much more patient-friendly and easy to administer. So this is, again, back to that long-term strategy to create the best regimen possible. So for Magenta, those antibodies, are those are those used as sort of like delivery vehicles to talk, you know, for that targeted conditioning? Is that how the antibodies are used? The antibody, it is, it is the conditioning agent, actually. It basically, if it goes in your bloodstream, it'll find the HSCs, bind to it, and then go in, and then it's got a payload that will get rid of the, the HSC, um, and but, it, but in a very targeted way because of the targeting of that antibody. Got it. 
So BEAM-201 for the treatment of relapse refractory refractory T-cell acute lymphoblastic leukemia is a potent and specific allogeneic CAR-T targeting CD7 malignancies, which uses multiplex-based editing to simultaneously make four knockout edits at over 96% efficiency for each gene. Relapse refractory, refractory TALL is a severe disease affecting children and adults uh, with a five-year overall survival rate of less than 25%. What excites you about your differentiated platform for T cell editing, and why do you, why do you, what do you say to you know opponents who believe that you might you might be at a disadvantage in terms of using knockouts and not using a double trend break to insert CAR into the track locus? Hmm. Yep. Yeah. So this is now our second big therapeutic area after sickle. So immunology and thinking about cell therapy, uh, making things like CAR Ts, and so. You know, here we're taking advantage of the fact that base editors don't create the double stranded breaks. And what that means is we can stack edits on top of each other with virtually no limit and have no consequences. Uh, wow. Whereas if you do that with nucleases, you're making a cut, you make another cut, you make another cut. Now the cell is even more challenged knowing how to put the pieces back together again. And it's going to be quite alarmed to see all of this genotoxic activity happening at the same time. And so what happens when you get to two, three, especially and anything beyond three number of edits is if you're using a nucleus, you get lots of DNA damage pathways that turn on, you get cell viability loss and you get chromosomal translocations and rearrangements. And that's where these pieces are getting put together in the wrong order. And that's quite concerning. So with base editing, we get none of that. Uh, I like to joke that it's almost as if the cell doesn't know it has been edited uh, because it's a very subtle process. And I think you know, from a pathway, you know, gene regulation perspective, it looks like that's true. Um, and so with uh, Beam 201, uh, we, we want to take advantage of that. So we made a cell product that has four different edits. This will be the first quad edited uh, cell product in the industry, I believe. Um, and for a target, we chose T cell leukemia. And so, so B cell leukemia, acute leukemia is the place where all the CAR Ts are working, CD19 famously. Um, but the T cell side was left alone. One of the reasons it was left alone was that in addition to edits to track and other things, you had to also get rid of the target of your car because otherwise your car T cells will attack each other before they have a chance to attack the tumor. And that's called fracture cell. Uh, and so it just needs a lot of editing to, to get this to work. And so that's right up our alley. So, so we think there's a great demonstration for that. So one of the edits is to knock out CD7 so that when we put in the CD7 car, the cells will be perfectly happy until they get in near the tumor and then they'll attack, right? And so that's, I think that's, it's a great program. Uh, it's very exciting. We're knocking out four different things. And these are patients who really don't have good options. And so they desperately are in need of new therapies. Beyond this, there is just an infinite landscape uh, of possibilities in cell therapy. I think cell therapy and editing are gonna go together forever. And I believe that as the cell therapy landscape advances, people are going to want to basically add more and more edits because you're going to want to add more functionality. The more we learn, the more we want to do to these cells to make them better, that's going to play to base editing's advantage uh, where you're going to want to use this multiplex. Now, the last piece is the CAR, which you mentioned. So, so in terms of getting the CAR in, there's really two options. One is lentivirus, uh, which is the standard that Bluebird used and uh, Juno and Kite and, and all those companies. And then editing, you have the opportunity with the double stranded break to create a cut bring in a template and then insert it at that cut site. And uh, and specifically people have liked the idea of putting it in the track locus so that mm -hmm. instead of expressing track, you're expressing the car and maybe the regulation will help a bit. So so that's a, that's one sort of special component. So we will always do multiplex editing with base editors to knock out as many things as we need to. And then for the for the car knock in, we have both, we have both available to us. So we have a nucleus called Castel B that works very well. And in fact, we just partnered it with Sana uh, to do some really cool cell engineering work and they do need to knock things in. And so that made sense for them and and it, and it works. Um, if for Beam 201, you know, Lenti is already well validated and we and we felt that that was a, an easier path forward. And, and we are not yet convinced that there's a big benefit from the track insertion. Um, I think we'll see, we're just sort of watching the data accumulate. But if, if it turns out that track insertion is gonna give you an efficacy boost of some kind, then we can shift the platform over there. But I think I think Lenti works great as well and is the standard of care uh, for a lot of CAR-T products. And so that's where we were for 201. John, what have you seen that makes you feel so confident that you can stack more than, you know, four edits or five edits, and, you know, maybe even go up to eight, nine edits? What makes you feel confident that you guys can actually do that? Have you seen anything, you know, preclinically? Yeah, well, we've done we've done eight, actually. Okay. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it still works. 
Um, I don't think we've we've bothered to go much past eight. I think I think the problem you get you get to that point. I think actually our editing capabilities are beyond our biology insight. Okay. Right. I mean, cancer, <laughs> I like that. cancer, cancer and immunology are complex systems. So there's still got to be the careful work of saying, what do we want to edit and, and why, and, and how does it work? But, but um, right. I, I think we published quite recently uh, a, a, a kind of next gen program idea where we're looking at CD5 for another form of cancer T cell lymphomas. Um, and there would be these, we use five ads in, in that product and we, and we showed, showed that data. So, so yeah, it, it, it can keep going for sure. So part of the investment thesis for Beam is that not only is your company bringing potential best-in-class editors and therapies to the pipeline, but that you also have a platform where you can out-license your technology and benefit from downstream royalties and equity. So as you just mentioned, you know, a couple of minutes ago, could you talk to us about your partnerships with Verve, Apelis, and Sana, like you just mentioned? Is this out-licensing out -licensing strategy a big part of what Beam is planning to do in the future? Yes. Yes, it is. I mean, so... You know, the, the steps in the strategy were basically, okay, we have this incredible technology. We're really excited. We want to bring it broadly. These are complex systems where you need payload, delivery, manufacturing, and we don't want to have to cobble that together every time. So let's get all of that under one roof. Mm -hmm. Let's go deep into science and innovate to make even these things better. So we're doing more editing work. We have a nucleus. We have other things as well. Delivery, we're innovating there. Manufacturing, great. Once you've done all of that, as I said, you have way too much uh, in, in the platform to do yourself. And so we've got to do partnerships uh, that gives us the chance to sort of say, here, these are the things that would fit best within Deem, and here are some opportunities to put it outside. So, so the three you mentioned are great examples. Uh, Verve was the first one. Uh, and in that case, they were already a company, uh, basically a group of, of really amazing uh, cardiology experts uh, had this vision to use gene editing to do a permanent knock down a cholesterol pathway and effectively eliminate your, or drastically reduce your later risk of any heart attack. And, uh, and it's an amazing vision. And, and it shows you, I think, how, although we're beginning in rare genetic diseases with you know, severe you know, mutation status, um, this technology as it matures is gonna move relatively quickly to more common diseases and to even things like, like disease prevention, risk modification, et cetera. So I think it's a, you know, that's one of the things I see happening um, you know, in the coming decade. So, um, so with Verve, we gave them all of our technology. Uh, they, they, they ended up doing a bake-off between nucleases and base editing and, and chose base editing. It was more potent, more precise, uh, and, and um, worked great. Uh, so, so their program is now moving forward, uh, targeting PCSK9. And then Beam has a, an opt-in right in the U.S. Uh, for a 50-50 split uh, on that product, uh, which, is, which is really exciting. And so it's a good example where we can you know, we don't get money from them, but we get some strategic value and, and rights later that we could participate in. And, and a great product moves forward that we probably wouldn't have been equipped to do because we don't have that cardiology expertise. A palace very deep in complement biology, a uh, complicated pathway, um, but they had really interesting ideas about how to think about editing. And we wanted to work with someone like them on what does it look like to intervene in a complicated biological pathway using editing? Uh, and so, so that's a great, great program and a great um, uh, deal with them. That obviously brought in money. So we, we have a $75 million deal there. And, uh, and we, again, we have an opt-in to uh, share of the U.S. rights on one program. And then Sana uh, is working on allogeneic cells and in vivo delivery. Um, but for their ex vivo programs, they need to do a lot of editing. And so we did a deal with cas 12 b uh, which is a nucleus that, that we weren't doing too much with. Um, other than that idea of maybe use it for a CAR-T insert. And so, but, but Sana can do, can, can do a lot with that in the near term. And so that was a great deal, 50 million up front, uh, non-exclusive. So Beam is still able to use cash flow B for, for any purpose, but it gets cash flow B moving forward and start to get developed. And, and so that's pretty exciting too. So, so yes, I think you should definitely expect that Beam will do a lot more of these kinds of things. We try to be very creative uh, on, on how we approach these, these situations. It's not a cookie cutter approach, but you know, any time that I think there's synergy with someone outside who has a great team or great capability and anything we have that can help, um, unless we're doing it ourselves, that's something that we would like to, to see happen. And I think this will be a, a real distinguishing feature of the Beam strategy over the coming years. I think it's just more evidence that uh, we love to call, you know, the ultimate deal maker. We, <laughs> we constantly see Beam coming out with, you know, these amazing partnerships with companies that we all love, you know, we're a Palisana, you know, these are companies that we follow and companies that are doing, you know, really, really great things. Um, I did want to ask you, John, is Verve going to continue to be using the base editors or is it just with the PCSK9? 
you have any insight on that? Yeah, so they're actually are, are also using base editing for their second program, uh, ANG PTL3, uh, which is which is also very exciting. And we have that same uh, opt-in uh, to that program as well. There are another couple uh, targets where they have rights to our stuff as well. Um, so I think they 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 certainly are in the next program at least, and they and they may well in the future. Uh, you know, Ver Verb has always said we're, they're, they're technology agnostic, and so you know they're just looking for the best technology for a given application. So. I mean, I'd leave it to them to sort of go target by target and decide what the best editing strategy will be. But certainly for the first couple, it looks looks clear they're going to be using the base editors. And I think that those programs look really strong. Got it. Awesome. Thank you for that. And so your lesser known RNA editing platform, Repair and Rescue Systems, where Repair is capable of A to I editing and Rescue is capable of T to U editing. Where do you see this platform really shining in comparison to the DNA editing that you can do? Yeah. So, so yeah. So, so some of that editing innovation I mentioned beyond base editing, um, we got Castrol B from Feng Zhang's lab, uh, and then uh, we also got these RNA editing systems as well. And so they're very interesting. They basically use a different CRISPR that can target RNA strands instead of DNA strands. And then once there, use the deaminase to do a sort of single base edit, which is very interesting. Um, the whole field of RNA editing, I think, is, is still earlier, uh, obviously, than DNA editing. And it has a different feature. Basically, the edit you make is now transient, so it's not going to last for the lifetime of the patient, it's gonna last for the lifetime of the mRNA that you've edited, which will be a few days, right? And so that's the key difference. And so, so you have to think of basically one of two paradigms here, and we're not the only ones thinking about this, there are other companies in this field. One would be, do I express the editor forever? Or do I chronically dose it so that I'm constantly editing the mRNAs as they come out to make some kind of an impact? And, and that can work, um, although you now have the challenge of it's a chronic therapy and, and you're basically delivering this forever. Um, the other thing you think about is it well, transient delivery to make a transient impact. And so something like regenerative medicine, which we've talked about before, where maybe you want to change a cell's behavior for a while, drive it in some new direction, but then you want to let go and have it stop. Uh, so that would be a really interesting application for, for, for RNA editing as well. And so we're, we're doing some of these things in our, in our platform on, on this technology, but I think it is definitely much earlier stage. I think for a lot of the diseases that people know us for, whether it be sickle or the liver diseases, things like that, um, I think all things being equal, uh, I think if you can do it with a DNA edit where it's a permanent change, and you've given a lifelong cure to a patient, I think that would be preferred. Um, and so that's kind of our primary focus, I think. But RNA editing, I think, will have a role to play and we're, we're exploring that. And so last but not least, um, and perhaps one of the most exciting things about Beam is your partnership with Prime Medicine, which is currently still mostly in stealth mode. You and Dr. Liu have mentioned, you know, a divide and conquer approach. Can you talk us through that close relationship with these two companies and, uh, you know, how you plan to pursue Prime Editing in your own por portfolio? Um, and do you foresee that these will remain separate entities for the foreseeable future or, you know, any hopes of profit sharing by any chance? Right. Um, yes, I think they'll remain separate entities uh, for the future. Um, so yeah, Prime is very exciting technology. It, it falls into that sort of same next gen category that, that base editing falls into, where uh, you know the, the similarity is we're going to get rid of the double strand break, we're going to target the DNA, and we're going to bring along an effector that's going to do something once you're there that's very precise. In the case of base editing, it's a deaminase, where we make a chemistry driven single base change with high efficiency. In the case of prime editing, you're bringing along a reverse transcriptase, where you're going to try to rewrite a short section of DNA uh, and have that get back into the gene uh, and sort of do local rewriting. I think there will be other categories. There, you know, there are people using transposases uh, of various kinds to try to insert large genetic elements uh, into genes. So I, I think that this general feature of you've separated out the targeting from the editing elements, and now you can independently mix and match and optimize those. Um, is going to be a big feature for the future. And then I think you're going to have sort of a, a, a wide toolkit of different types of tools. You know, if you want to make a very precise single base change with high efficiency in any cell type, base editing is going to be it. You want to make more flexible local rewriting, prime is going to be what you want to use. If you need to drop in an entire gene, it's probably something like a transposase or, or other sort of, of technology. So, so we see all of these sort of having a role to play in the future. So with prime, uh, as it came up, um, uh, we worked with with David uh, and actually with the same investor set that we had at Beam to do something that I think is pretty innovative. Back to the idea of trying to be as innovative on the business side as we are on the on the science side. And so we said, well, look, this is really new technology. It's going to need its own build. 
But at the same time, you know, it has some application that could be similar to what base editing is doing. Um, and we have a lot of beam that might be helpful to, to, to exploit for the technology. And so, so what should we do? And so what we did is we set up a new company, it's called Prime Medicine. Um, we were all of the interim leadership of that company in the early days, uh, and I'm still on the board. Uh, David obviously was the founder. Um, and then the same investors invested in it. And then that company took down the editing uh, rights from, from the road. And then we did a deal between the two companies. And so the deal basically says that Beam will share delivery technologies and, and other things with Prime and help set it up. And then we take in return for that exclusive rights to use Prime editing technology for any edit that is similar to what base editors can do. And that's that 30% of the correctable mutations that I mentioned before. And so, um, and so that's a lot of territory, which is exciting. Uh, and then Prime takes the rest of it. So the idea is that that divide and conquer idea is that basically it, it sort of means that we can double down on our target space using Prime if we need to. And then Prime Medicine will focus on different uh, diseases than we are. And I think when people see the Prime Medicine pipeline, you'll see that that is in fact exactly what's happened, which is, which is I think a good sign that this sort of creative structure is, is working. Um, I think, you know, still early days with Prime technology, but, but a lot of progress being made. And we're certainly excited about that for the future along with, I think, a lot of other um, interesting systems that are coming online. I think if I could draw an analogy, I think that it's it's sort of like we're in the early 80s uh, with computers, right? And, you know, we're, we've now got the, the first laptop or we've got the first personal computer and they're they're amazing, but they're also going to keep changing. And, and these things are going to keep evolving over time. And and not only that, but when, when we think about where we will be in 10 years or 20 years, it's going to be mind blowing compared to even where we are today. And so the most important thing for us as a company and others is, is to be part of all of this and to, and to stay you know, relevant and stay on the cutting edge of these different technologies or to build the delivery engine, right? That through which any genetic payload can be, can be um, delivered, right? So, so that's that, that sort of critical mass we're building in all of the integrated capabilities to do what we call precision genetic medicine well um, you know, that's really the strategy. And, and so, you know, obviously base editing is a, is a big part of the future. And I think it is working so well. I think it'll be the, probably the majority of what we do for the, for the medium to long term. But, but, you know, very long term, ultimately we're flexible and we want to build really a team and a capability and a company that's capable of leading in this field for the long term. So will Prime be staying away from your specific indications? And do you, do you see that maybe, you know, once the time comes that you can use, well, create future future iterations of, of this thera therapy or therapeutic with Prime. Is that what, is that kind of what you're saying? You know, for future iterations of Sickle, for example. Yeah. So so yeah. So Prime will stay away from our indications. Um, so so only Beam has the rights to use Prime and Sickle, um, uh, and then the other diseases in our sort of universe as well. Um, and so. So yeah, so I think we, you know, we've got it if we need it. I think that um, again, base setting is working really well. So I think it's not, I wouldn't expect that Prime displaces base editing in, in a lot of these areas. I think it maybe comes in handy, you know, if, if we have some, maybe a challenging base editing target, Prime can solve that given its flexibility, that would be great, right? So that, that's where it expands our toolkit, uh, which is quite exciting. But I think, um, I think it's, you know, I think the companies will basically have, I think, different applications from each other over time as we as we apply this in different areas. Gotcha. Thanks for clarifying that. And John, the last question. Um, a lot of people are always asking me, you know, when are we going to be able to be buying merchandise from Beam? You know, when can we buy sweaters and hats, you know, sweatpants and things like that? Will, will we ever have like a merchandise store where, you know, your fanatics can can purchase apparel? All right, that is a great that is a great point. I'm going to think about that, and I will get back to you. And if if we do it, you'll be the first uh, to get the email. Um, awesome, for sure. <laughs> awesome, we can't wait. Okay, everybody, thank you so much for uh, tuning in. I hope you enjoyed that. Thanks, Matt.